Hi, everyone. Welcome to our session on a deep dive into macOS MDM. Um, my name is Jesse Endall. I'm Max Vidalje. Uh, I work at a company called Fleetsmith. We're an Apple device management product. And I'm a staff engineer at Dropbox. Uh, a little bit of background on why we did this research. Uh, so, you know, it's what, it's what our product does. Uh, so we have kind of a vested interest there. Uh, it handles, you know, OS updates, app updates, uh, security policy enforcement, uh, and compliance for Apple devices. Uh, we have a really high security bar for, um, for our products, so we want to make sure it's secure by design. Uh, and we've put a lot of work into making sure that's true. Uh, our goal with this talk partially was to increase the security of uh, MDM and DEP and also kind of raise the bar for all MDM vendors. And I just wanted to work with Jesse again. <laughs> so, quick agenda. Uh, we'll be covering some basics, uh, some terminology, some concepts, moving into an overview, uh, followed by the deep dive section, uh, which Max will walk us through. Uh, also disclosing the uh, vulnerability that we found uh, and explaining how that works. Uh, then we'll actually be exploiting that. So we have uh, a laptop here in the box. Uh, if all goes well, uh, our demo will work with no issues. Uh, and finally, we'll, we'll go through the fix and some conclusions and takeaways. So let's jump in. Uh, what is MDM? Uh, it can be a confusing term because it can refer to an entire kind of product category. Uh, when we say MDM, we mean Apple's uh, specific uh, flavor of MDM which is uh, protocol, uh, as well as a few uh, other things that we'll touch on uh, to set system configuration in a centralized way through an MDM uh, server. And uh, that MDM server is built by a, a third party. It's not something that's run by Apple. Uh, so that could be Fleetsmith, that could be another product like AirWatch. Uh, so if you've heard of uh, kind of mobile device management products, that's what we're referring to here. Uh, and an MDM server can send MDM commands to a device. That includes things like a remote wipe command in case the device is lost or stolen, as well as a command to install a configuration uh, profile, which could contain something like password complexity requirements for your enterprise, or um, perhaps you know, Wi-Fi network settings to join the WPA2 network and include the you know, network password, for example. All right, DEP. Uh, this stands for Device Enrollment Program. Uh, this is a complementary uh, technology to MDM, and it allows you to have devices automatically enroll with an MDM server uh, immediately upon first boot, the first time they connect to the network. Uh, this is most useful, obviously, when the device is brand new because it can help you achieve the holy grail of IT workflows, which is a zero-touch deployment workflow, meaning the IT team never has to touch it. The laptop ships directly from Apple to the employee. They're the ones to unbox it, connect to Wi-Fi, and boom, it sets itself up automatically through your MDM product. Uh, obviously, this could also be useful for reprovisioning re workflows. If you have an, a device that's being used by an employee, uh, they leave and you want to wipe it and redeploy it, uh, it could also be useful uh, in that scenario as well. SCEP, uh, this stands for a simple certificate enrollment protocol, and this is a way for a device to send a certificate signing request. This is a request for a certificate uh, to a SCEP server. Uh, generally, this is going to be implemented as part of the MDM product. Uh, the client will, you know, send its request. Uh, the server will evaluate whether or not it should grant the certificate. And if the answer is yes, uh, the client, the device, will receive a TLS client certificate that's used to authenticate later on to the MDM server. Configuration profiles. I touched on this briefly already. This is Apple's standardized format for enforcing system configuration, such as password complexity requirements, Wi-Fi settings, disk encryption, you name it. Uh, it's a file format that can contain multiple payloads. Uh, so you can have one file that contains the settings for all three of those things. And it's based on the plist or property list format, which is an Apple-specific um, flavor of XML. Uh, the payloads within the um, configuration profile can also optionally be signed and encrypted to validate origin, uh, ensure integrity, and protect their contents. So a quick overview of the entities at play here. Uh, there's really five key players. There's Apple themselves running uh, some of the server infrastructure and, of course, the manufacturer of the devices. Next up, you've got uh, resellers. This would include um, large resellers like CDW. It would also, in the world of DEP, include Apple Retail. Uh, 
Um, third, you've got the MDM vendor. Fourth, you have the customer. This is the company that's actually, you know, trying to manage their devices uh, for their enterprise. And fifth, you, of course, have the device itself. Okay, protocols. The MDM protocol is really a combination of two protocols. Uh, the first is Apple Push Notification Service, APNS. You might have heard this in relation to other technologies such as iMessage, if you've, you know, sent uh, iMessages on your iPhone. That's actually built um, partially on top of APNS. Next up, it's also uh, a RESTful API. So there's sort of two pieces to this here. And that's the part that the MDM server implements. Uh, and that's a RESTful API. Communication occurs between the device and the MD MDM server. And uh, the device receives commands in plist encoded uh, dictionaries. This is all over HTTP HTTPS. Uh, and optionally, MDM servers can be pinned, but it's not a requirement. Authentication uh, works differently for each of these. So as I mentioned earlier, that client certificate issued via SCEP is used for authenticating to the MDM server. Um, for the push notifications, that's actually uh, done via a push notification token. Uh, we won't get, be going in depth on APNS today because there's already been a lot of research um, on that whole area. So uh, that's why we're, we won't be uh, diving into that today. All right, DEP. There's actually three separate APIs related to DEP. One for resellers, one for MDM vendors, and one for the device itself uh, to prove its device identity, uh, which is undocumented. The uh, nice thing about all these is they're more modern APIs. They use JSON, uh, no plists. And uh, today we're only going to be focusing on that middle one there, the MDM to Apple uh, communication uh, between the MDM vendor product and the uh, DEP cloud service API. Okay, the cloud service API, what is this thing used for? It's another RESTful API. Uh, there's two main use cases. One is to sync device records. So when a reseller or Apple themselves adds a new device into their internal uh, DEP database somewhere, uh, then those device records need to be synced over, pulled into the MDM product somehow. That is done over this DEP cloud service API. And then the other thing that happens is the MDM vendor pushes back uh, what's called a DEP profile, which contains uh, a few different things. And that DEP profile is delivered to the device later on, the first time it boots up. So that DEP profile, which is a JSON payload, contains three things. The MDM server URL, uh, any additional certificates that need to be trusted for the sake of pinning, as well as any setup, uh, setup assistant configuration you want to do. So that setup system you see when the Mac first boots up, you can customize which screens are shown there. Uh, and this authentication is handled with OAuth between the MDM server and Apple. So SCEP is another RESTful API. Um, it was created at a time when uh, TLS and HTTPS weren't that widespread. And so it relies on CMS or PKCS number seven signed data uh, to ensure message integrity. It supports the concept of a challenge password for authentication. Uh, unfortunately, in the RFC, that's really just defined as like a string. Uh, we think that field should be uh, used a little bit more uh, carefully. Uh, and so what we do is we actually stick an HMAC in there that's server generated so that we can correlate that with a uh, specific enrollment request from a specific user. All right, establishment of trust between all these things. Uh, it's pretty complex and we're not gonna go into it in detail here, but we do cover this very extensively in great detail in the white paper. Uh, so definitely check that out. And it's just important to call out that uh, there's a lot of cross signing that goes on, a lot of uploading and downloading of certs uh, in order to get to the point where the MDM vendor now has the right to send MDM push notifications down to the device as well as um, sync those device records to the DEP servers with Apple and push those DEP profiles back. All right, some differences here. Um, the authentication for, the, uh, for MDM is via AP APNS, whereas for DEP, it's that OAuth token. So different auth stories here. All right, putting it all together. So there's sort of, if you look at the entire life cycle, uh, the entire bootstrap process for uh, DEP and MDM, this is what it looks like from start to finish. Uh, this is kind of hard to, to get an understanding of, so we made a visual for this. Uh, as you can see, the first step is the uh, reseller or Apple creating that device record. The next thing that happens is the customer 
the enterprise, actually goes into something called Apple Business Manager, which is a web portal, and assigns that device to a specific MDM server. Uh, from there, the MDM server is able to sync those device records over, as I mentioned earlier, as well as push those DEP, DEP profiles back, up, um, back to Apple. Uh, next, the device actually checks in uh, via DEP to Apple, receives this profile. Then we've got the um, sort of bootstrapping uh, of the initial MDM config, uh, which Max will walk through in greater detail. And uh, finally, the device can start receiving MDM commands, like that remote wipe command, uh, install a configuration profile, et cetera. All right, thanks, Jesse. Um, so today's deep dive will focus on the four later stages of the process. Now, for more info on stages one through three, I do recommend you check out the white paper. So as we've seen, the later steps involve the device itself. Uh, in these steps, macOS interacts directly with Apple uh, and the MDM vendor servers. Uh, we're gonna use a scenario here to sort of walk through the deep dive. Um, so imagine a user uh, is getting a, new, a brand new MacBook uh, and, and isn't an, unboxed it. Um, that MacBook has been previously configured by the employer to set itself up automatically uh, via DEP and MDM. So DEP and MDM enrollment on the Mac involves many different agents, demons. Uh, it's a bit of a confusing maelstrom of dynamic linking and IPC. Uh, however, a, there is very conveniently a single framework that abstracts away all that complexity for us. That is the private configuration profiles framework. Uh, this gives you a set of functions that map really well to the steps that we're gonna go over today. So if you've ever seen this screen, um, then you've seen what is called the setup assistant or uh, internally named Mac Buddy. Uh, this, is the, the app, this is actually a Cocoa application. This is the first thing you see when you turn on the device. So that is its icon, complete with bow tie. Um, the Mac OS setup assistant is one of the users of this framework and that's how it enables uh, DEP and MDM enrollment. So to simplify our overview today, we're gonna take the point of view of the Mac setup assistant and we're gonna use that framework as a lens uh, to look at each step. So let's recap. So we have four steps to go over. Uh, the first one is the DEP check-in. Now, the purpose of this step is to ver verify whether the device is DEP enabled. And if so, we, we have to sort of take special action. Um, so in this step, uh, internally, this is called retrieving the activation record. Now, Jesse detailed what a DEP profile is. That is roughly the internal name for a DEP profile. It contains almost all the same information. Um, this is implemented uh, by a daemon underlying the configuration profiles framework. Uh, and a bit of a quick note on this, this is a pretty common Mac OS pattern. Um, in order to guarantee privilege uh, and process separation, Apple will typically farm out work to daemons under the hood that have specific entitlements allowing them to do the work. And so the configuration profiles framework itself doesn't really do anything here. It just signals an underlying daemon uh, to do some extra work. Now this step will begin as soon as the device is connected to WAN. So the second it has a network reachable or internet reachable IP, it will, it will begin to attempt checking in. Uh, this is driven by the private CP fetch activation record function. Um, and as I said, it's implemented by a daemon called cloud configuration D. Now this is a launch daemon, which is Mac OS lingo for it runs as root and, and, can, uh, and can be uh, kept constantly running. And uh, it is signaled through macOS specific IPC called XPC, um, which if you've, uh, if you've done any kind of iOS development or Mac development before, you are either directly or indirectly uh, aware of. So let's go back to our fancy architecture diagram. So we have setup assistant, which has now linked the framework, and it is ready to uh, call the function to retrieve the activation record. So at this point, it sends a message to Cloud Configuration D over XPC to say, well, you should actually implement the, uh, the fetching process. And now we'll go over exactly what happens during that process. So at this point, before we can make the request to Apple to, request, uh, to, to actually retrieve our, um, our DEP profile, we need to establish a rather peculiar type of encryption, uh, which is internally called absinthe. There's the object in Cloud Configuration D that runs this is internally called MC Tesla Configuration Fetcher, which is partly so, uh, pretty well named. Uh, so this manages a five-step process. The first step is to plainly retrieve a certificate from Apple servers. Now, one quick note on this, Absinthe is a rather complex topic, and we're not gonna go into too much detail, but we'll go over the sort of basic steps here. Uh, 
Um, so first, it retrieves a certificate. Next, it uses that certificate to initialize the internal state of absinthe. This is called, this is a, through a function called NAC init. Um, this, interestingly, also uses various uh, device specific pieces of data. Things like the serial number, which it retrieves via IO kit, but also MAC address um, and, and others. Now, with that data, once the initialization is complete, it posts the, essentially the, that raw data back to Apple uh, via the session endpoint. We're not exactly sure what this does, but it appears that an extra handshake is necessary to ensure the device is who it says it is. Um, and finally, with the result of that, it, it calls NEC key establishment, which completes the initialization for the encryption. Now, what we believe is that Absent's job is to provide a way to encode on a per device basis, uh, and so to relatively securely identify a device for Apple. And finally, now that the encryption is ready, we're ready to make the request. The last step is to make a post, um, including a JSON payload, to the Mac profile endpoint. Um, what this will do is take the uh, example JSON payload below. Uh, it will encrypt it using Absinthe, Base64 it, uh, sign it, and send it over, uh, over HTTPS. So let's go back to our architecture diagram again. Now, as you can see, Cloud Configuration D is interacting with Apple at this step, and it's using both TLS with the uh, standard root certificates installed on the device, along with uh, the, ec the extra layer of, of Absinthe encryption. And it, at this point, it basically says, I am this device, I am this serial number, um, what is my activation record? What is my DEP profile? Should I be enabling DEP? Now, in response, the server provides a JSON dictionary. Uh, that is essentially a slightly differently formatted version of the DP profile. Uh, and this includes what Jesse mentioned, things like customizing the setup assistant. But most importantly, this includes two fields that will unlock the next step. The first one is the URL of the MDM vendor's uh, activation profile endpoint. We'll go into exactly what that means, but that's the main thing that will enable the next step to occur. Mo but most importantly, it also re uh, returns the uh, DEP profile's anchor certs property, meaning for that URL that is re referring to an MDM vendor endpoint, you can also provide DR encoded certificates to pin that next request. And so, so far, we're able to validate server trust and we'll be able to continue to do so. So going back to the overall process, we now know that we, may, we are a DEP device or not. Now what's next? This step is called profile retrieval. Um, in this step, we'll be retrieving the configuration profile from the MDM vendor directly. So we're done talking to Apple for now. So if you've ever seen this screen, um, this is actually the screen that indicates that your DEP profile has enrolled you into DEP. Uh, once the activation record is downloaded, this will uh, appear. It is possible to allow users to skip this in, in case they don't want enrollment, but it's also possible to make it mandatory. So in this case, you can see uh, that there's no skip button. So in this step, we need to retrieve the activation profile. Now, what is an activation profile? That is the internal name for a DEP delivered configuration profile. So uh, Jesse detailed config profiles earlier. Those are a rather versatile uh, plist based uh, files that contain multiple payloads that can be installed on a device. Now for MDM purposes, um, this is a little bit more restricted, but, and, and we'll, go, uh, we'll go into that in a sec. This step will begin immediately as soon as the user clicks next. Uh, it's driven by another function in configuration profiles.framework called CP get activation profile, uh, unsurprisingly. However, this one is not implemented by cloud configuration D. This time it's implemented by a somewhat older component of the OS called manage client.app. Um, fun fact, this is actually part of the older MCX infrastructure that predates much of uh, this today's modern MDM. Uh, what's also interesting is it doesn't use XPC this time. It uses MIG, which is a much older IPC mechanism on Mac OS. This is also a, a launch daemon uh, running as root, though it can uh, delegate to per user tasks in some scenarios. However, in this case, uh, there is no user on the device yet, and so almost all of the work happening in the daemons will be happening as root. The implementation here, in case you're, uh, you want to go sleuthing, is, uh, is, is the following. So what exactly happens to in this step? Um, so we send a request to the URL that was provided earlier. That URL is pointing to an MDM vendor server somewhere, and its job is to return a configuration profile. And again, if the anchor certificates were provided, uh, the uh, implementation will actually pin using those certs, and we validated that that is the case. Um, now, a request is a very simple property list uh, containing up to seven keys. 
uh, providing device identification. So while the device is identified with Apple already, it now has to prove who it is to the MDM vendor. And in this case, it will provide a serial number, uh, but also a UDID, uh, OS version, product name, uh, that kind of information. Now, the, that request payload is interestingly CMS signed and DR encoded. Uh, it is signed using the device's identity certificate that's part of Apple push service. Um, Interestingly, it also includes uh, supplementary certificates in order for, we believe, to, uh, to validate them. Uh, but that certificate chain includes an ex an, a now expired Apple iPhone device CA. It is unclear why that is still the case. It is likely a very good story. <laughs> so let's go back to the architecture. Uh, at this point, managed client is ready to talk to MDM. Uh, and it says, well, this is who I am. And what is my configuration profile, which the MDM vendor can now provide in response? Now, in this case, TLS is used, and the anchor search will be used to pin. So we consider this step as being secure. All right, so we're on to step six. We have the configuration profile. We know we're in DEP. What do we do next? Well, config profiles now have to be installed. Now, as a quick reminder, a configuration profile can be installed in many ways on Mac. You can get it automatically through DEP. You can actually download it and double clicking on your desktop, which is how uh, some uh, small startups, IT uh, departments might operate. Um, you can also retrieve it, uh, you can also receive one through MDM itself, which lends to, that leads to some uh, fun recursiveness later. But now that we have a profile, we have to install it. Now, once it's retrieved, uh, the profile is stored on the system. The location is not super relevant, but what is interesting is that it is system integrity protected. Uh, what that means, uh, in case you're unfamiliar, uh, SIP is a mechanism introduced in macOS Sierra, I believe, which allows the protection of system uh, folders. And so no one, including root processes, can write to those folders. So technically, the profile is secure. Now, this step will begin automatically as soon as the profile is retrieved if you're in setup assistant. Now, again, this also maps to a function in configuration profiles dot framework, uh, which again is aptly named uh, CP install activation profile. Interestingly, this is implemented by yet another daemon called MDM client, um, which again is rel relatively recent. So this one's using XPC. Now, it can run either as a launch daemon, so meaning as root, or as a launch, or uh, as a launch agent, meaning as a user, uh, depending on the context. In our context, so in, in our scenario, it will be running as root. So a quick refresher on configuration profiles. They are these large XML documents. They can contain multiple payloads. Uh, and the installation of a profile essentially amounts to looping over the payloads and installing each one, one at a time. Now, the framework to do so has a plugin-based architecture. Each payload type is associated with a plugin. And so, for example, uh, the certificate payloads, so if you are using uh, the configuration profile to deliver a certificate, uh, will be implemented or will be installed by a certificate XPC service. Now, XPC services are the modern way to achieve uh, privilege separation on macOS. Uh, interestingly, plugins can either be in the main framework or in the older managed client application. And so that can make things re relatively confusing um, when you're looking for traces. So typically, an activation profile, so a DEP delivered config profile, will include, uh, if provided by an MDM vendor, three payloads. Now, the, the top one is uh, expected, uh, com Apple MDM, and this contains the settings necessary to enroll the device in mobile device management with the MDM vendor. Uh, but you can also include uh, other payloads, such as SCEP, to securely provide a client certificate to the device, or PM, in the case where you would want to install a trusted CA certificate to the system's keychain. So if you've uh, ever read Apple's public documentation on the MDM protocol, in installation of an MDM payload actually is actually equivalent to what Apple calls the MDM check-in protocol. Now, the, uh, what that essentially does is sets up the device uh, for receiving commands from an MDM vendor. The payload in, in an MDM, uh, pay, or the, the, the MDM payload in the configuration profile uh, will typically include three important properties. First, there's gonna be the check-in URL. That will be used in the immediate, and as well as a command polling URL, which will be used later on. Uh, that also includes the APNS topic that you can use to tell the device uh, via push notification to pull the uh, command polling URL. 
So to install the MDM payload, um, in the immediate, a request is only sent to the check-in URL. This is, again, implemented in uh, MDM client. What's uh, important to remember here is MDM payloads can actually depend on other payloads. So you might be asking yourself now, how do I pin? I've just introduced two new uh, URLs uh, that are MDM vendors. So there's, they're third-party URLs that are not uh, Apple signed. So how do I actually pin those? Well, the answer is, is fascinating. Uh, the MDM payload is allowed to depend on other payloads in the configuration profile. Uh, so for example, uh, the, both the check-in and server URLs have matching properties allowing you to refer to another payload by its unique identifier. Uh, and that essentially says the certificate in that payload include, it, you should pin using, basically. The other important thing that the payload has to include is an identity certificate. Each device has to have a certificate that uniquely identifies it. This is mandatory. This is another property in the MDM payload, and it's meant to uh, refer to another certificate. Typically, uh, SCEP will be used, though it's, I don't believe that's the only way to, to achieve this. It is probably the best way to achieve this. I guess one last thing on this. It, what's, I guess what's important here is that you're essentially pinning by ID. You're not pinning by using a DR encoded list of anchors, uh, which is a little bit easier to do. So going back to our architecture diagram, the setup assistant requests uh, through configuration profiles that the profile be installed. And so MDM client receives that. Um, fun fact here, it actually loops back to itself uh, because of the recursive nature of profiles, but we're not including that in the diagram uh, because that blew my mind and it, uh, it, it was not enjoyable. So uh, it, the request that's made here uh, goes to the check-in URL on the MDM vendor's uh, servers, but again, it is TLS, but it is pinned with a certificate if you provided that ID. And so you have a way of making uh, this secure. And so now we get to the last step. At this stage, the MDM uh, server is ready to send uh, a, a pr provision devices commands. So after the uh, check-in is complete, that means that the push notification topic is ready and the device is ready to, to receive notifications. Once a notification is received, MDM client, again, that same process, will be handling the push and will, in response, pull the MDM server uh, using the server URL uh, property of the payload that was passed in. Now, this, of course, makes use of the other uh, properties in the payload as well. And so you are going to be able to pin that request using the matching uh, pinning certificate UUIDs uh, property. Um, and then, and then the, the identity certificate property I mentioned earlier will be used here as the TLS client certificate once, uh, once the uh, polling request is, is made. So a little bit more visually, um, the process is now asynchronous. So we start bottom left with the MDM vendor uh, who decides to uh, issue a command to a device. It uses APNS to send uh, the push to the device. MDM client receives it, responds to it, uh, but not directly through the push service, by definition. It does that by contacting the command endpoint on the MDM uh, vendor's servers. And again, you can see that it is using TLS and you are able to, uh, to pin using the certificate IDs. And so, so far so good, right? And now we get to the fun part. MDM supports a very wide range of commands. And one of the most popular commands is install application. Uh, this is pretty self-explanatory. It allows remote, silent installation of applications on the device. What's interesting here is that's implemented not in the MDM infrastructure on the device, but it's implemented in using the App Store's uh, APIs. So the command request contains the URL to a manifest. The manifest's job is basically to describe the app package. It says this is the, the app's identity, this is its certificates potentially, and this is where you can retrieve it. Uh, the manifest is going to be encoded as a property list, as many uh, Apple payloads are. Um, but importantly, it includes the URL of the package to retrieve and install. Now on macOS, that has to point to a signed distribution package, which will be a .pkg. Now the way this is implemented, and we're going to go really deep here, um, MDM client will use the Commerce Core framework. Um, this is part of Commerce Kit, which is the private APIs built around the App Store on macOS for other uh, OS services. This framework contains various services. Each are backed by a specific launch agent or daemon, depending on the context, again. Um, store Asset D's job is to download and process manifests. Uh, 
And if they're valid, it will leverage stored download D to download and install them. Now, what happens when MDM wants to install a manifest is it uses a private function called CKMDM process manifest at URL. So let's look exactly at how this works. MDM client, while executing the install application command, will link against commerce core framework, it, which will itself use XPC to trigger the asset daemon to process the manifest and validate that it is correct. Once, or I skipped a step there, it will actually first download the manifest from the MDM vendor's endpoint and then process it for validity. Now what's interesting here is there is no pinning and we'll get to, we'll get to exactly what that means. And again, once the, once the manifest is validated, it will download the package itself and install it. What's interesting is the MDM and the store, they're two very separate components of the OS. It's safe to say they have different threat models. Um, the MDM client here is not evaluating the trust of the manifest URL and neither is the store. In fact, store foundation, which contains the core classes that power Commerce Core, do not evaluate trust at all. Um, this allows a man in the middle attack. So as an example, in this case, um, a state actor or someone with considerable resources could target a specific organization by man, man in the middle and commands from the MDM vendor. Now this is not limited to the DEP scenario we've looked at. This could actually happen during later commands if the MDM can be established. They, they can't uh, man in the middle of the commands, but they can man in the middle of the right. fetching of the manifest. That's right, sorry. The, the, you can man in the middle, not commands, um, but the actual install application command. And with that, we'll go to our demo. And while we get set up, I'll go over the, uh, the details of, uh, of this. So we're gonna simulate a malicious ISP or a state actor by using Mac OS's internet sharing, as finicky as it is. Um, we're gonna be proxying all the traffic from, the, from a brand new device uh, using man in the middle proxy. We're going to simulate a compromised CA by using a valid cert that we created from Fleetsmith CA. Uh, and we're gonna intercept the request for the manifest as the device first boots. And, and rather than provide the Fleetsmith, uh, Fleetsmith's agent, we're gonna be serving a malicious manifest that will do download a mysterious other application uh, and install its package. Now what's important to, uh, to say here is that developer ID certificate requirements still apply. Uh, and so uh, packages still have to be signed. And so there is the extra step that an attacker would have to, to, to take of actually signing their, their malicious application. Um, though this is still relatively easy to do. Uh, it is important to note though that Apple is making great strides here with things like notarized developer ID certificates. Um, they are adding quite a bit of, uh, of, of checks to make sure that malicious software is, is harder to create but this is still strictly possible. And uh, the last thing I'll add there is um, the developer uh, certificate that's used to sign that distribution, distribution package does not have to be um, any type of uh, cert that's associated with a business entity. It can be a personal uh, Apple developer certificate. And so for the sake of this demo, uh, that's exactly what we've done here. All right, when with that, So the device is first booting. Let's see if uh, once the graphics adapter gets ready, I think we'll be able to see what's going on. Yeah, it's worth calling out that um, the only way that this is possible is um, by really simulating that nation state level attack by both being able to man in the middle uh, the internet traffic from the device, so maybe having the ability to see internet traffic at the ISP level, as well as having the ability to uh, get a certificate issued improperly from a commercial CA. Uh, both of these things uh, have happened, uh, sometimes in the same country, uh, sometimes in countries that are not friendly to uh, you know, journalists, for example. So it is uh, a real world uh, kind of situation here uh, that we're simulating. Um, but it's worth calling out that the only reason we can do it is because the device at this point in the bootstrapping process already trusts uh, the Fleetsmith CA because it's uh, delivered in that initial uh, configuration profile. So uh, this can't uh, be done without uh, a lot of resources, basically.
All right. So let's uh, make sure we have some network connectivity before proceeding here, since that is pretty important. So for some reason, this one's not working. We'll, uh, we'll but let's test with this one, which we just freshly wiped. So it should work just fine. Demo gods are networking. Yep. Okay, this one this has network. This one's ready. Okay. So let's go ahead and proceed. There we go. There's the remote management screen. So this means that the device has received its DEP profile, that JSON payload. So at this point, it will retrieve, uh, at this point, it will retrieve the configuration profile and install it. And we are actively man in the middling, uh, which you cannot see, unfortunately. All right. All right. Let's proceed. And so at this point, um, we can tell that the looks like it worked. Yeah, it looks like the uh, the payload was installed. The agent was downloaded, or what it believes is the <laughs> agent was downloaded. And uh, this is usually the the part where a progress bar would be nice. But yeah, it usually takes around thirty seconds at this point. Yeah. And there we go. And uh, the agent has been replaced with the calculator. Um, and so, <laughs> and so, what is supposed to be Fleetsmith's uh, agent software is now. So, our package, our malicious application, in this case, uh, created a, a launch a launch agent or a system level launch agent that cannot be stopped, that runs the calculator constantly. And so, I don't believe you can close this. I don't know if we fixed that, but I think we, I think we removed that. Oh, maybe we fixed it. Yeah. yeah, it was it was pretty annoying when testing. Um, yeah, so we installed this to uh, the system wide launch agents folder, which means any user that logs in we'll have uh, the calculator started. Uh, it's important to note though that uh, even though we launched this in a user context, uh, at the time that our malicious package is installed, uh, we do have the ability to execute any command as root. Uh, and so this demonstrates that the device is actually fully rooted at first boot. All right, let's go back to the slides. Thank you. Well, the good news is th there is a mitigation already in existence for this problem. Uh, a new command was introduced recently called install enterprise application. Uh, this includes new properties that allow you to control the trust of, uh, of that URL for the manifest. And so this is available in Mac OS 10.13.6, uh, thus also 10.14. Uh, what's also important to note here is that there's a, uh, there's a time delay uh, for new hardware to support the fix, as we've just demonstrated. Um, What's also important here uh, is that this requires the MDM vendor to do its part. Um, the new command has to be adopted before the mitigation is, is fully ready. Now, how does this actually work? Uh, there is now an extra property, uh, manifest URL pinning certs. This is, a, again, a list of DR encoded uh, anchor trusts that will be used when evaluating the trust of the manifest URL. Uh, this can ensure, uh, you can also ensure that cert re uh, revocation checks are performed, which is quite nice. Um, under the hood, what, what happens? Well, the CKMDM process manifest at URL function, which used to only take a URL as a parameter, and another thing that was more of a flag, uh, now actually takes in a dictionary. Uh, that dictionary contains private keys that map to the properties in the new command. Um, and also, most importantly, store foundations, uh, core objects, now have the ability to evaluate trust, which was re a relief to see. Um, they actually, if you're curious, this actually uses NSRL connections, uh, standard delegate methods for uh, authentication challenges. So let's move on to some takeaways here. Uh, number, number one, this is a really complex system on macOS with a lot of moving parts. Um, some will have different threat models, and what that means is vulnerabilities or bugs can appear at the intersections or at the borders between those. Um, Jesse? Yeah, so in addition to uh, these takeaways here, we, uh, through our research, uh, came up with a bunch of recommendations uh, for Apple here on kind of how to improve the whole uh, security uh, story for MDM and DEP. And so here is that list of recommendations. Uh, the first is that we'd really love to see 
uh, the entire security model for DEP and MDM documented. Uh, if anyone's read the incredible uh, iOS security guide white paper that they've published, uh, that's really what kind of the, along the same lines of what we're thinking here. Uh, so we know they have the ability to produce something uh, of a really high caliber. Uh, and, and we'd love to see the same thing, including a, a description of what the role of that I Apple iPhone device CA is. Uh, the next is that we'd really like them to um, be more aggressive in uh, a technical enforcement uh, in the OS that requires pinning for all of these things. Right now, all of this is really optional and up to the MDM vendor, um, which given uh, how early in the, in the process it is uh, and, and the kind of really scary implications, uh, if if an attacker uh, was to really um, package up this exploit uh, and use it at scale, uh, we really think that it would be a great, uh, a great improvement uh, if, if this was uh, required. The next is that um, we really think any configuration profile that contains sensitive data, so that could be like a, a TLS private key, for example, or it could be the uh, Wi-Fi payload that includes uh, the plain text password for your corporate Wi-Fi network, right? Uh, any payload that includes sensitive data like that, we think the OS should uh, enforce that it's both signed and encrypted. This is also optional, um, but uh, it's, it's really not very heavily utilized uh, in, in the wild by, by various products. Uh, Fleetsmith does do both of these things. Um, but we'd really like to see this required as well. And you might be thinking, well, isn't this already TLS protected? Uh, and the answer is yes, but if you look at the past few years, you've had Heartbleed, you've had Poodle, you've had Apple's own go-to fail bug. And so given the history of TLS phones, uh, we really think that this is a great defense in depth measure uh, to require that these sensitive payloads are, are protected. And in fact, Apple's own documentation says uh, uh, on page 19 of the config, uh, configuration profile reference, they give this guidance that because the password string is stored in the clear in the profile, it's recommended that it be encrypted for the device. Uh, and you can get really powerful here and encrypt these payloads on a per device basis because the SCEP server uh, can safely escrow the public key, which is part of the certificate, right? Um, even, even though it doesn't have the private key, it can use that public key to encrypt these payloads. Uh, and so that's, that's something that should be relatively straightforward for, for people to implement. Um, the last one is that we'd really like to see that DEP cloud service API contain just a bit more information. It already contains information on like the model, uh, the OS family, so it'll tell you if the device has Mac OS or iOS, for example. Um, but we'd like to see two additional fields in that API, one with the OS version and one with the OS build number. And the reason we want that is so that we can surface that information in product so that if there is a vuln um, on a version of Mac OS that's shipped from the factory, at least you have the information uh, at your corporation from you know, your IT team, your security team, ha at least has the information to know maybe we shouldn't uh, rely on, you know, uh, uh, on that OS version uh, if we're shipping it to you know, a country that uh, might be doing some of these things that we've talked about, right? All right, uh, and then for uh, MDM vendors, uh, we, we wanted to share what we think of as sort of like a security checklist uh, to make sure that you're doing all the right things. Uh, and we tried to make it kind of really concise and targeted on just the highest impact things. So pinning at every step of the process, super important. Um, the anchor certs in the DEP profile so that the first time the device calls in to the MDM server, that's pinned, uh, that's step four. Step five, which is pinning the actual MDM URLs for ongoing um, polling for new commands, uh, both for the check-in URL and the commands URL. Um, and then finally, uh, in step seven, pinning using the new install enterprise application command. So right now that is also optional. Uh, install application is not uh, deprecated, it's still available. Uh, Apple has given strong guidance uh, at WWDC when they announced the install enterprise application command that they'd love to see vendors move to this, but they didn't give a hard timeline uh, and it is still optional as well. Um, and then finally, this is the one that I think is the most subtle. Uh, a lot of vendors uh, sort of supplement the functionality of MDM with uh, an agent binary that they've written themselves. We do the same. Uh, it's really important that the vendor is pinning inside their own binary as well. Uh, so we, we do the same thing. Uh, we pin our uh, root CI within our uh, binary to make sure those uh, communications also can't be man in the middle. And finally, uh, SCEP is really the best option for 
getting these device identity certificates uh, generated. And the reason SCEP is far superior to alternatives is because the private key is generated on the device and never leaves the device. Uh, the server never sees it. Whereas uh, the only other alternative is the server actually generating all those client private keys and distributing them down to the client. Uh, and I think at least one vendor uh, does this currently. All right, uh, next is the configuration profiles. We already touched on this. Uh, we really think that they should all be signed and encrypted, especially if they contain sensitive data. And finally, um, this is more about the cloud production environment uh, or uh, even on-prem as well, but any sensitive uh, data that's being input into the product, like that Wi-Fi password, right, a private key, all of that should really be encrypted at rest in the database uh, within the MDM product as well. All right, uh, disclosure timeline. Uh, we first disclosed this to Apple on April uh, 28th. It was acknowledged April 2nd. The new command was announced in that session at WWDC titled What's New in Managing Apple Devices on June 7th. Um, but Apple, of course, did not share the sort of background uh, history there. Uh, that's uh, obviously what we're sharing today. Although they did strongly urge uh, vendors to move to the new command as soon as possible. Um, the MDM protocol reference documentation was updated to include uh, the install enterprise application command on July 5th and the actual uh, ability to use that command with devices was introduced uh, with Mac OS 10.13.6, which was released on July 9th. So this concludes our presentation, but we have a few acknowledgements we wanna make before, before we're done. Go. Yeah, first and, first and foremost, we really wanna thank um, my co-founder, uh, Stevie Hershew, uh, who did a really incredible job on all of the early research for this talk. Um, like a, a straight week of, of you know, eight to 10 hours a day. Uh, the next uh, set of people we really wanna thank is uh, uh, Victor, uh, Papayan, Mike, and Jesse, who have uh, contributed just a lot to uh, the Mac kind of security community, um, as well as uh, last but not least, Apple, Apple of yeah. course. <laughs> uh, they've been really great actually throughout the whole process. And obviously, you know, even though we found this vulnerability here, uh, both Max and I just have a ton of respect for their security engineering team and what they're doing to improve the platform security for both iOS and macOS. Um, and we just wanna say, keep up the good work. All right, and uh, with that, we are done. I think we may have time for one question, but thank you so much for coming.